have you been doing this for, Sarah? Oh, hello, oh. and we're live. <laughs> How long have I been doing this for? I have been doing yeah. lives. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. I've been doing a weekly-ish live since about January 1st of 2023. So happy six months. This is it. Oh, congratulations. Happy yeah. half birthday. Thank you. Yeah, so welcome, audience uh, of the live and of the replays. Uh, I'm Sarah Merritt, uh, board certified in anesthesiology, uh, pain medicine as an interventional pain doctor, and also in addiction medicine. And I'm really excited today to have a guest, Sarah Nasser, who's also a physician and board certified in family medicine, soon to be board certified in addiction medicine. And uh, I'm really glad to talk to her um, and have her talk to us about how um, how she sees people get better with treatment and uh, maybe talk about uh, some about opioids and and how how patients can get better with with treatment yeah I'm so excited to be here Sarah thank you so much for you know inviting me uh, I I think it's so important it's a very important topic to talk about because you know uh, I think, especially within the provider, the medical field, I think the stigma needs to be in like, you know, removed so we can be present more fully with our patients and help them, um, you know, achieve the life that they're truly trying to get to. And a lot of times having some biases from growing up, um, it can get in the way of being able to facilitate that for our patients. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great. That's great to have you here. Um, I'll share um, some of Dr. Nashler's links to social media. You can find her on Facebook and she as her self as a person. And then also um, you have a coaching practice, I believe also. Yes, I'm just getting launching that. So I'm really excited about it. Um, and, you know, the goal of that is to basically help people also overcome the limiting beliefs that hold them back so they can transcend into, you know, their fullest potential and fill into and grow into their purpose. So that's something what I'm doing right now. And it's bringing me a lot of joy and growth and i want to connect with those who are also similarly mind like-minded people awesome mm -hmm. um so i'm going to share uh dr nasser's links here of uh her page and her Thank you, Sarah. um so yeah i think um i'd love to just talk a little bit about um your experience with with treating patients and and i think maybe even just to talk about like opioids in general in the in the US maybe also but um, you know I would say when I started treating patients with opioid use disorder or just got even interested in you know what is this you know how do we care for patients that have a problem with opioids um, and a lot of the treatment industry has been historically oriented around abstinence and just mm -hmm. like hey you shouldn't do that don't take this medication, you should just stop. Um, yeah. Or an abstinence only rehab type of center where if somebody has a problem, well, really all we have to offer you is to just say, hey, stop doing that. And then we'll have a bunch of counseling visits around that. Um, and, and it turns out that maybe that's actually not the best treatment. And, and wow, as a medical doctor, I got all the way through my training and really didn't even know that for sure um, until I got a little deeper into it as a, a physician and really looking a little harder at opioids, opioid use disorder, and, and what, what are the best treatments for this problem? Yeah, no, that's a great um, transformation. I, I kind of started at a similar uh, situation, you know, uh, when we enter medical school, we are also bogged by all um, you know, the, the beliefs that we come in with and that carries through. And until we are in a situation where our, our pre-existing beliefs are being challenged, we will continue with it. And that, uh, um, you know, problem that you mentioned where we have this abstinence-based approach for uh, opioid addiction, it unfortunately still exists. Um, it's very prevalent in 
um, play in, in areas that should be supporting the patients, um, such as when they're going to sober living facilities or they're looking for housing or going for counseling and sometimes even the 12 step programs, you know, it's more about like focus on your faith, focus on your inner power so you can overcome it. And it completely ignores this physiological, chemical, neurological, like change that happens in the body yes. that leads to the disease of addiction. It's right. not just a willful thing. It's, it's not as simple as that. And so um, being able to connect with our patients that way, being able to counsel them through, educating them on the science behind what's happening, that's something that helps me significantly impact not only my patients, but the team that's taking care of them, like other specialists and sometimes, you know, the um, facilities where they're living to recover properly. Yeah, that's that's really powerful. And um, yeah, I think um, I think it's just it's just such a, a challenge. And I, I I am encouraged, I would say, um, as I see trainees or you know younger people in their training, you know, where there does seem to be a legitimate interest in the um, you know kind of bigger public health issue, right? And that certainly you know opioid problems affect a lot of our society here in the U.S. Um, there is impact in, you know, crime, there's impact for the individual who is, you know, potentially sick and maybe not able to, you know, be their best selves. You know, there are just so many, so many layers. Um, but I, I would say that I've been encouraged to see um, a lot of people, um, particularly early in their career, that are really, you know, hungry to go help this problem. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, significant awareness kind of arose through COVID. Uh, when I was um, first became interested in um, the addiction phase, I think my first exposure happened when I was um, doing third year medical rotations in mm -hmm. Princeton, West Virginia, which was a very rural, very, you know, uh, in the mountains, Appalachians, uh, not a lot of population. So I was doing OB rotation there and I was exposed to the babies re uh, suffering from neonatal, no, neonatal abstinence, excuse me. Um, <laughs> And, you know, at that time, all I was was prejudging uh, the moms who were doing this. Like, how could you do this? How horrible can you be? You know, that was my full blown mindset. And then throughout my career and my journey, when I uh, ended up um, finishing up my residency in Elmira, New York, apparently we were in a trail, like there was a trail that went from Mexico to Canada and we just happened to be on the route is what I heard in that area. So we were sitting on this like drug route. And so um, that's where my exposure to opioids came. My attendings, not everybody, but there was this one specific attending who was taking care of these patients very specifically. And at that time, what we had access to was Vivitrol. I didn't know what methadone was at that time. Um, right. Suboxone, it was just starting to come around. And then in 2018, when I started my um, attending level work, um, that it was in DC and that, that's when like there was starting to be like have a lot of awareness, like SAMHSA, ASAM, they were having a lot of progress communicating yeah. with the um the decision makers and there was some funding available to train primary care doctors to do suboxone um, and dispense <clears throat> and so in dc i worked with a, a significant amount of underserved population uh, and predominantly african-american population in that area um, as well as in the homeless shelters, men's and women's homeless shelter. And, you know, it was very heart wrenching to see what it was doing. And so that just fortified my conviction to, you know, um, do this. And I really appreciated the opportunity to see a person's life transform with the right treatment, with the right support. Um, and so, you know, that kind of fortified for me that this is something I definitely want in my practice. Mm -hmm. And that as um, you know, I pursued this addiction medicine subspecialization opportunity. Now I'm working in a methadone clinic. Um, and now um, 
you know, once upon a time, the method, and even now, the methadone clinic carries so much stigma with it because of, you know, the type of, how the patients look when they come because they're withdrawing. And you, it's it's not a comfortable, like when you look at the symptoms and you talk with them, like you, I can't help but feel sympathy for these people. 180 degree turn from medical school life to where I'm now, right? And so, um, so being present with sympathy, being able to explain what's happening to them, helping them overcome their own personal stigma against mm -hmm. uh, this medicine, because a lot of times they think when they're leaving the opioid, they're just switching it out for another drug, you know, and then calling that perception out and resetting that. I think it's something very important for us healthcare professionals to do. Mm -hmm. um, tell my patients is that, you know, we're not switching a drug out for other drug. You are going from a disease to a treatment, right? Just like diabetes, you wouldn't say that you are addicted to insulin, you know, if you're a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic who needs insulin. So this is at this point, what I'm doing is I'm helping you close this chemical gap that has happened in your body from this years, mm -hmm. months of previous use um, that has basically disrupted your body's ability to stabilize itself. And you need that homeostasis to function and to survive. And your body created that because um, in order to protect you from this influx of these extra chemicals that it doesn't naturally need, and it puts you out of um, control, you know, your body wants you to protect itself. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it starts to downregulate the receptors available and the natural chemicals that are normally released for that euphoria or that pleasure reward pathway. So in the process, what happens is the threshold of your, the baseline of your body changes and changes and changes as you're pushing it down. So mm -hmm. now when you take the opioids away, you know, your body is stuck here. It's yes. not back where it needs to be. And so what we're doing in the treatment with the methadone or the suboxone is we're mm -hmm. closing this gap. So we're helping your body feel like it's up here. So big okay. difference because yeah. when you are using methadone on the streets to get high you're trying yeah. to go to cloud nine which is up here you know we don't want okay. you up here. so you know just being able to um explain it this way to the patients i think they see it yeah. in a new light and they feel empowered that you know hey yeah i'm actually doing something to take care of myself not yeah. you know just hurting myself even more well, and certainly when I talk to patients, you know, if, if I'm speaking with a patient who's on methadone or buprenorphine, they will often acknowledge, you know, hey, I'd like to not take this at all. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to help them see it as this is part of that journey to being better, um, yeah. that I can see as, as being very, very valuable. Definitely. And then, you know, it also then allows them to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. where um, all their supporting system, be their family, their work. Um, once again, like, you know, in this population, going into a sober living facility is significant because mm -hmm. you need that environment to help you be successful. And so I tell my patients, you know, use this time instead of focusing on, I have to be out by New Year's Eve or I have to be out by um, so-and-so's birthday or, you know, Focus that energy instead on, um, you know, getting your support system in place. So when you are off, mm -hmm. you don't relapse because you don't want to keep relapsing. Right. So it's a very like it take it, it, it um, engages a lot of the ecosystem mm -hmm. that's necessary for good health. Okay. And so meaning families, friends, finance. Uh, okay. mental health, um, taking care of your other physical health, like hepatitis C, you know, if you have hepatitis C and you have uh, cirrhosis, you don't want it to go into cirrhosis 
because mm -hmm. then it's going to affect your methadone metabolism and stuff. If you have diabetes, you know, you want to get that under control as well, because that impacts your body's ability to heal and to return to normal. So it's that holistic approach. And I love it. That's great. That's great. That's so exciting that you found a, a place in medicine where you feel really um, called to help people and, and like you're able to make such a difference. For sure. Yeah. That's exciting. I think, um, yeah, I think that's really great to have um, those conversations with patients. And, and and I guess I wanted to just piggyback on that. I know we were saying that, you know, patients may see treatment with methadone or buprenorphine as something they may do for a while and part of healing and getting better. On the other hand, there are people for whom these are lifelong therapies. Is that correct? And are yeah. those people doing the right thing or is that a problem? What so with, yeah, for sure. So with the disease of uh, substance dependence, it can become a, there's an acute phase or subacute phase, and then there's a chronic phase. So the way I help my patients reconciliate with the understanding of that mm -hmm. is it depends on basically how long you've been using, how bad your body has been injured, um, what your support systems are. If you're somebody who's coming to me, basically a brand new um, person, like you're just brand new in the addiction status and the substance dependence status, uh -huh. chances are you uh -huh. will be able to walk away over time without needing to go back as long as you don't relapse. So that's the, you know, going forward, just make sure not to relapse versus somebody who's coming to me at the age of 70 and they have been using for 40 years yeah. they're injecting like two grams of heroin a day um yeah. and that is best. yeah and so i use the example of stroke at this stage you know i say like you know sometimes your body is able to recover from a stroke depending on how bad the damage is. And you can maybe regain a lot of the functions with physical therapy, speech therapy, different types of therapy, but it might be something that you might have a deficit for the rest of your life that your body is unable to recover from because the damage was so irreversible. So if you're that person, you're gonna yeah. be the one who needs that chronic help because your body just cannot close that gap anymore. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, it's like like damage from a stroke, right? That's, yeah. that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, and I think also just even that concept around like, you know, fault or causation, you know, I think like very often in, in my experience of, of talking to patients, if they've been using opioids chronically, even whether for pain or, you know, with an addiction problem, I think there is this concept that there's like some reason or some, some blame. And I think that idea around, um, you know, just accept as fact that, hey, there's some damage here. Well, in the context of that, there's going to be more, more healing required. There's going to be more time required. And, and really what caused it sometimes isn't exactly even the most critical factor. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes the patients are not at that stage to accept it. Um, you know, that contemplation stage, if they're ready or not. That is a huge thing. Um, you can see that their intention is there. I mean, sometimes they're just coming because it's court mandated or they think this is gonna be an easy fix. Um, and sometimes patients leave. But I think at that phase, what's important to do is to you know, give them the education so they can make that educated decision, even if they leave AMA uh, against medical advice. Um, and then just being like, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen if you are somebody who's able to do great i mean the mind is a powerful thing you can do a lot of recovery like you know healing based on how you um set your mind what what frequencies you set your mind to but then the body does have its ability to either heal or not have what it uh, suffer if it doesn't have what it needs mm -hmm. but the main thing is that we're here for you you know, go try out what you got to do. But if it doesn't work out, and if you find that the information I'm giving you does come true, and I do establish some sort of report with you, 
our door is open to help you because you know unlike your drug dealers we care about whether you live or die Uh, yeah yeah no i love that and for sure over the years that i've worked with patients with opioid use disorder in particular yeah you definitely see people in and out of treatment or they may they may do well and be away not even because they've relapsed but because they're doing well and then they may you know return when the circumstances dictate i think that's really um huge and and um a gratifying i think part of of working with those patients is for me and and for you both i bet is is forming those relationships and where where people do feel they can they can come back and they know that you're going to be there regardless of the circumstance yeah and in terms of the gratification i actually feel sometimes it's a lot more gratifying than treating diabetes or high blood pressure or even cancer that's end yep. stage because you know with the diabetes high blood pressure people don't take it seriously and because they don't feel the pain of the witch like you do in right. the witch- symptoms yeah. um, and with the cancer sometimes you really can't do much about it um you know, you, just, you know are you do your best to be there with the patient who's terminally ill uh, but you know there's no there's i mean you don't see that rapid change that significant impact in a societal level because yeah. not only are you changing the patient's life you are changing the family's life you, you are. are changing maybe even the economy because they start to go back to work and then sometimes yeah. when the patients are so changed that they become a source of inspiration for others then they go and they amplify so it's just for me that's like the like the bad gratification just keeps yeah growing. that's super cool yeah. yeah yeah that's amazing um yeah and i've said that too even about also about just even treating patients with chronic pain and you know when you've helped a person with with chronic pain you've helped them off mm-hmm. with their work problem and i think there's a parallel you know same but different that that person mm-hmm. who's in withdrawal or who's suffering you know related to you know, drug use or opioid use disorder. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, there's just a lot of suffering that goes with having that problem. And so to be to be able to um, help and, and the medication treatments, you know, are, you know, are very effective. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what yeah, I've seen is the real turnarounds. Yeah, and you brought up a good point about um, you know pain management. It's it's such a it feels like almost the other side of the coin of addiction for a lot of our patients yeah. because a lot of times that patients end up on um, substances in the first place, especially downers like opioids, is to um, escape the pain. And, you know, I think that's where uh, the pain management specialist and the addiction medicine specialist working together closely is significant um, because there are some patients who have legitimate reason for pain. For example, ankylosing spondylitis, you know, Uh rheumatoid arthritis. Those are things that should not be, you know, passed on as you know oh you're just a drug seeker your pain isn't real i mean pain is real no matter how big or how small it is if you're suffering from it it's the worst pain in the world right Mm -hmm. um a lot of the pain can be you know managed with i mean the mind has a significant influence on pain perception Mm -hmm. if you're depressed your pain perception goes up if you're anxious you can't handle pain as well your threshold changes So taking care of those elements can help improve a lot of the pain. So that's another um, specialty that is very important here is having a mental health specialist. Um, But when it comes to like legitimate reason for pain, you know, um, I I feel like that's another place where where the stigma in the medical field uh, can be um, improved. Um, yeah. because I have had consults where the patients are coming to methadone clinic because their doctor is like, oh, I cannot do surgery on you until you like basically quit methadone um, or if you quit opioids or something. Hmm. It, it, I, I see where they're coming from. There's a lot of fear because of the misunderstanding maybe. Right. Um, but um, I think that's a place where you know, there's great progress ha- waiting to happen. Yeah. Well, and I, I think in um, 
Gosh, yeah, so, so much to unpack there. I think um, for sure, you know, so I treat patients with chronic pain more than I treat patients with addiction. I have both types of patients in my practice. Um, but, you know, as I've done some lecturing th with the University of Maryland and, and given some presentations for residents and fellows, um, you know, I got to looking at, you know, a lot of the data around the pat patients, people who are in opioid treatment programs, um, they have a way higher incidence of chronic pain than the general population. And a lot of it is like prior to their diagnosis. It's not like, oh, I got on methadone and now I have chronic pain from taking methadone. No, it's really like I had pre-existing pain and in the process of, you know, dealing with it, which sometimes involves self-treating in certain ways, um, patients may try, you know, substances and end up um, using opioids. Um, but I, I think that is just super, you know, interesting and um, just really helps me, I mean, maybe understand too, you know, where, where some patients are in their journey, right? That, um, you know, when, when you have a significant chronic pain problem, there's just so much to, to do to try to deal with it. And that might include, you know, prescription or non-prescribed opioids. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about what you said about opioids and surgery, um, you know, for sure, as a, as a pain doctor, you know, one of the things we see, you know, just following the literature, um, you know, there are, you know, more complications after orthopedic surgery in patients who take chronic opioids. And usually the studies that um, are being done are more around patients taking opioids for pain. And kind of with the idea, you know, I think there is um, an idea out there of, of, you know, hey, if we can have fewer patients that need opioids for pain, that would be a good thing. Um, but, be, you know, and so if we if we are all aware that there are risks, but but to your point, like, you know, there are risks was that, but does that really mean you can't do surgery on a patient that takes a chronic opioid for pain? Or does that mean you can't do surgery on a patient who needs buprenorphine for opioid use disorder? Um, you know, I guess to me that, that all doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but it's interesting that you're, you're, you've seen some, some cases like this. Yeah. I think in that perspective, um, you know, if you go down to the way the body works, you know, the, what I described before that if your homeostasis is just so broken, that yeah. if your baseline is up here and you're down here mm -hmm. um, and you go in to the surgery at this place where you're already in a, your body is in a chaotic survival mode. It's not in a stable healing mode. I would think that you would have more complications versus if you are on that controlled um, baseline with the methadone or suboxone. Yeah. Um, it would probably be easier to address the remaining pain. I think these patients look like they have a higher tolerance because they are like down here, they have developed higher tolerance. So if after this gap is closed, I think then they can probably be more stable to deal with the recovery from all these other instances like surgery. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, sure. Tell me a little more about your I'd like to wrap us up here since we've been on close to 30 minutes, but I want to hear just a little bit more about your coaching and who is it that you that you help in your coaching. I'd love to make sure that we kind of cover that so that if, if people wanted to connect with you or get more of your perspective that they could do so. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, like, um, I really um believe that our limits are set by us and um if you are able to work with yourself to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. uh, we are able to accomplish amazing things i mean for us you know most likely the people that are listening to this are going to be doctors who have overcome so much um obstacles and gone through training and dedication to like achieve it. Like we are living examples of how much we can accomplish when we set our mind to it, you know? So, um, so on that note, I think when, I mean, I especially like working with people who are trying to figure out how to guide their careers because mm -hmm. our work has significant impact on the quality of our existence, not just living, not just life, 
but our existence. You know, as humans, I think at a level, we all have a desire to contribute, whether you are a <clears throat> stay at home mom or CEO of a multi billion dollar company. Everybody wants to leave some sort of contribution, a mark on earth that we existed. So that's kind of what led me to getting certified for coaching. And I want people to also experience that, that, you know, how we can transcend what the limits that we set ourselves, how much we are more capable of than we think. So, you know, people who have that feeling that they haven't left that mark yet and they want to do more, that they're not living their purpose yet, because um, not having that sensation can lead to what burnout feels like or moral injury is the better way to do it. It makes it harder to deal with um, feeling satisfied. So to achieve that satisfaction through a process of work that, you know, uh, that involves your personal life, family life, work life, um, that whole approach is what I'm trying to pursue, you know, to design your own destiny mm -hmm. and pursue it. Fantastic. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Dr. Sarah Nasser, yeah. uh, transcendentyou at gmail.com. Visit her. Uh, I've included a link here to her Facebook page yeah. as well. So, thank you so uh, much. Thank you for sharing your perspective. I'm just so appreciative that you're doing good work in addiction medicine and um, getting people treatment that they need. Thank you. And I really appreciate for you taking the time to, you know, have a chit chat with me because this was great. I hope that it, it brings benefit to listeners as well. Yes, I think that it will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.